Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode where I just check I'm using the correct microphone. There we go. Uh, where I'm talking to Canon Brian Mountford. So, uh, Canon being your title in the Church of England where you're ordained, is that correct? Uh, that's right. I'm actually um, a canon of Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford. If you're a canon, then you're going to belong to a cathedral right. somewhere. Yeah. Um, it could be in Africa, but I mean, it, uh, it's just a a general title and there are two types there's the honorary canon which is me um, in other words I held another job outside the cathedral um, or a residential canon where you actually you actually work in a cathedral and as part of the staff. So I think you're the second um, Church of England representative to come on we've had a uh, Keith Ward on before uh, to talk oh, about Keith is to a good, have a, a good friend of mine yes yes yeah, Absolutely. he's mentioned in the book as well, um, which yes. we're going to be discussing today, which is Christian atheist, uh, belonging without believing. Um, so that's going to structure, I suppose, a bit of the conversation. But before that, do you want to fill people in a little bit on what your background is, how you came to be in the position that you're in, and considering the kind of thoughts that we're going to be talking about from the book? Yeah, well, I, um, I started life very young as a clergyman. I was ordained when I was 23, which is the... Um, uh, minimum age and uh, I worked in Westminster in London in uh, in Bayswater in London as a, a fellow and chaplain of Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge for about six years and then I became a vicar in North London um, in Southgate and then I came to Oxford where I spent the rest of my career as the vicar of the University Church and also a fellow of St Hilda's College. So my life really then was um, in the university uh, while, while running a, a church which had, um, uh, you know, 750,000 visitors a year. So it was uh, as busy as many a uh, cathedral just mm. because, because of where it is. I mean, Oxford being this great uh, sort of magnet for tourists from all over the world until yeah. the COVID lockdown. Yeah, and so so if you, if you were to broadly kind of fill people in on um, I don't know theological positions you've held throughout that time, would you consider yourself sort of a I don't know a, a Calvinist or um, a, a maybe definitely not when you hear that word? Or so you know, is it is there a progression of thought that might help people? I mean, labels can can be helpful and or they can also constrain. But I mean, is this some kind of yes. main schools of thought that you would consider yourself yes. a part of? Well, I'm definitely not a Calvinist and. Uh... I'm more more of a Catholic. It's a very complicated and subtle kind of set of distinctions which make up what you are as as a Christian. Um, so I've always regarded myself as a liberal, and I'm regarded in the church as a liberal, and by many as a dangerous liberal. Right. Uh, that's to say, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not a, an evangelical, um, and. Uh, I hold very critical views of uh, theological ideas and I don't take the Bible as um, written as it were by God and uh, I don't hold uh, very right-wing views about um, sexuality although in America if you say you're liberal they think it's all to do with morals right but in in this country when you're talking about churches and theology to be liberal is to be liberal about theological ideas uh, and there's a big difference there uh, but quite often the person who has liberal ideas about theology also has liberal ideas about sexuality right which is a, a a subject which has kind of weighed the church down over the period that i've actually been an official representative of it would you say that the kind of positions that you hold within the Church of England are sort of a, a majority or a minority view, um, you know, something that, that's on increasing in popularity or, or sort of decreasing and more people moving I towards think it's each other? diminishing, actually. Um, I, I mean, when I was first ordained back in the late 1960s, the Church of England was a much more liberal place, and you'd expect bishops and um, rectors of parishes to be involved in the life of the community and not to be part of an introspective group trying to preserve their ideas and their rituals and so on. And I think the reason 
for the change is is what we broadly call secularization. Um, it, that in itself is a complicated thing. It kind of begins with um, intellectual questions about whether you can believe the metaphysical ideas of Christianity and the miracles as literally true and so on way back in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it runs into um, a kind of period of indifference in um, the late part of Victorian England, I think, um, up to and including perhaps the First World War. Then after the First World War, you get a kind of um, um, a, a, a kind of re rebirth of interest in Christianity in Britain. I mean, I'm talking about Britain and not globally. Uh, and that kind of lasted until the revolution of the um, early 60s, which was a revolution of um, class rebellion and um, women's lib uh, and the Beatles and all the, all that change where Britain became a modern a modern state. And I think um, one of the crucial signs of change was when was what we call the deregulation of Sunday, which happened right. back in the um, early 90s. When I was a child and first a vicar, on a Sunday, everything was quiet, all the shops were closed. And, uh, you know, we had this notion of being a Christian nation, whether we were, uh, as it were, card-carrying members of uh, the Christian faith or not. Mm. It was just how we were. It was... And we still see all those signs of that sort of establishment with bishops in the House of Lords automatically uh, and so on. You know, we were once a Christian nation and now we're a secular, multicultural nation. And that has uh, been the great cause for change, I think. And as a consequence, as, as Christianity and the church in particular has been more and more marginalised in society. Um, so the reaction or the response of people who uh, feel that they want to be clergy like me becomes more conservative. If you've got your back right. to the wall, you kind of protect the conservative position because what else are you going to do? Hmm. It's only when you've got confidence that you can branch out into a more questioning, creative kind of religious perspective right. i think yeah that's it that's interesting the the idea that increased i i mean that i'm sure there's plenty of atheists and agnostics who are watching and have their own sort of thoughts and interpretations that they bring to some of the things that you're saying but it's interesting the idea that you know secularization would almost uh push people towards a more um sort of fundamentalist point of view if they're if they're going to hold on to it because it's it's yes. it's something that's going to you, you know, it's going to kind of insulate you with that, like, in-group, out-group, tribal thinking and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. um, Sort of thought. back to basics. So um, to move on to some of the thoughts, then, that are in, in the book, the topic of today's discussion. So the book is Christian Atheist, Belonging Without Believing. And I suppose the first question is, why did you broach this topic uh, at all in the first place? Sorry, I missed the question because I suddenly got a feeble response, feeble oh, sorry. signal. Why, why did you broach this topic at all in the first place? Why, why oh, yeah. uh, did, were you thinking about this, uh, this as a subject matter? Yeah, because um, working in the University Church in Oxford, which I established as a liberal centre, um, I was very much involved with talking to people who were interested in Christianity but kind of had severe criticisms of it and particularly struggled with um, some of the ideas as I said the metaphysical ideas and there were well-known people as well I mean Richard Dawkins was a was a is a friend of mine and we were neighbors and he is famous for taking an extremely hard sci scientific um, uh, adversarial atheist position against the church um, and I was in conversation with him and then uh, the same with uh, Philip Pullman the the author who is a different kind of atheist in my book I make a distinction between hard atheism and soft atheism 
hard atheism is the adversarial, uh, no holds, no prisoners taken attitude uh, towards uh, the atheist critique of Christianity. Soft atheism is having holding all those doubts and yet being sympathetic to what religion and Christianity in particular has achieved and is trying to achieve and what it expresses about what it is to be human and what it is to um, uh, try to answer some of the questions of why is there anything at all? What's the purpose of life? Does it have any meaning? What's my relationship to the universe, which is so vast and I am therefore so vulnerable? Um, so those are kind of philosophical uh, uh, questions. And at the same time, um, a lot of people had experienced aspects of church life, like its aesthetic, um, artistic heritage, both in the beauty of buildings, like some of our great cathedrals, but particularly, I think, in the music, both ecclesiastical church music, specifically written for church, like mass settings of the mass, and in the Church of England, the setting of of service called choral evensong, but also, um, as it were, the secular religious music, which you get um, in, say, M Mozart's Requiem, the stuff that's performed in, in concert halls rather than churches on the whole, is nevertheless expressive of a kind of um, sense of otherness, the sense of the, the transcendent. Because I think there's something about being a human, which makes us um, almost intuitively sense uh, a creative uh, um, something out there. We tend to use the language of it being out there. I mean, I would question that really, but nevertheless, it works mm. to think of something out there. You know, you think of the Christmas hymns like um, Love Came Down at Christmas, this notion of God, God coming down to earth from heaven. It's poetic, uh, pre-scientific language, mm. uh, but it really is referring to something which we intuitively sense. And some people think of, um, you know, in terms of chi or the life force or whatever, that, that there there is something driving something. <laughs> there is some sort of value which transcends us which uh, you know when you uh, it, do stop me if i'm going on too long on no it's okay question. it's you all right yeah, yeah quite a lot of material but when you come to um to ethics in that sense um uh, there is a question of whether moral ideas are relative or absolute now religion gives you an easy uh, sense of the absolute with the simplistic notion of God. If God approves it, then it's right, and it's absolutely right, because God is absolute. Um, if you look at something like marriage uh, customs between uh, different cultures, you'll find that some cultures um, uh, have monogamy, that is, you can only marry one person, and others have polygamy, where you can marry more than one person. So you would say, well, that ethics is relative. It depends where you are, in what country you're in, at what time of human history you're in, and so on. But I think, I think we really have a sense of, and perhaps a need for ethics to be absolute. Universal human rights is a kind of um, example of um, where our globe has got to a point where we think there must be some things that are absolutely wrong, like torture. And uh, religion is not, not providing a kind of um, a scientific account book for these things, but it's, it's dealing with these questions. I know philosophy mm. deals with it too, and history deals with it, but history doesn't always deal, deal with it very well. Religion is an important component of being human. It feels strange to say that almost in modern Britain because mm. we have become so secularised. But looking at the world as a whole, 
religion is still immensely important. And in the majority, there are more religious people than not religious people, globally speaking, but different religions, not just Christianity. So, so if we move a little bit into then this idea of um, Christian atheism, which is the topic a little bit more, you sort yeah. of you mentioned um, that as you as you began to sort of think about this topic, um, you talked about some groups like the Sea of Faith Network, and I'm a big fan of Don Cupid's um, work and, and some of his ideas. And then you also say, you know, that some of the people who you've had conversations with were um, a bit skeptical maybe of, of the topic because of its the looseness of the definitions involved or some of the troubles involved in defining it so maybe yeah. you could um speak to some of that and and elaborate a little bit more what this christian atheism thing is yeah well of course i chose christian atheism as a title because it's arresting it might not describe perfectly by any means what the content of the book is i mean it could have been agnosticism not knowing answers it, it, it could have right. been um devout skepticism um in other words people who are uh, adherents of the religious tradition but they're skeptical about the ideas so that this this is absolutely key to it i think um i quote julian barnes even on the back cover um saying i don't believe in god but I miss him. Right. And there is, religion has tended to be, you're either in or you're out. You're either Protestant or you're Catholic. Mm. You either believe it or you don't. And uh, life isn't really quite like that. So um, there are immense questions to be asked about religion. And I think, um, Modern Christianity needs liberating from the tyranny of doctrine that you must, say, believe absolutely in a creed. Um, I don't know if your listeners and followers will all be familiar with creeds, but there are statements of, I believe this, I believe that, and they tend to tell the Christian story and they imply that you must believe in the virgin birth, the resurrection um, of Jesus and the resurrection of all people and so on. Um, but in fact, that's about all, all they say. But it, it is, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it, it's demanding adherence to specific uh, beliefs and ideas, which is tyrannical. Because if you, if I were to ask... Um, all 200 members of my congregation one Sunday morning um, to say what they believe. Each one would say something a bit different. Mm. Uh, each person interprets this stuff differently. And I want to um, liberate people, including um, fundamentalist evangelical believers who have been told that if you don't believe six impossible things before breakfast, then you're not a Christian. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't belong. Um, right. And yet belonging is, is in the end, not about that. Um, it's about being part of a community and a part of um, a discussion group, if you like. We, I, I, I think discussion groups are terribly important because people are able to air their questions and their doubts. Um, for example, the, something that has troubled the church throughout its history is was Jesus in any real sense um, the son of God uh, why is that so important to believe what difference does it make um, some people say and what a ludicrous idea that a human being who was clearly subject to all the limitations of being a human uh, should actually be God as well and we've twisted our minds around this one over the 20 Christian centuries. Mm. And as some of you will know, it was the big issue um, at various councils of the church when we would, when people would, our, our ancestors were discussing um, what made, a, made Christianity Christianity. Mm. So at the Council of Nicaea, it was 
debated and uh, perhaps you don't want me to go into that kind of detail yeah well maybe, maybe um I mean, I guess, I guess we can, we can, I, I have got um, roughly some of the things you've touched on. It'd be interesting to go a little bit further into them, but maybe those details about the councils and things just in the yeah, consideration not, not of time. Important. Yeah. I, but I, I did want to touch on something that you said um, just then, because I, I do think that it's, it's interesting um, because a lot of people, even my most sort of uh my most dead inside ex-Christian atheist friend that I've got, um, you know, he'll say uh, he can listen to a piece of classical music and it will bring a tear to his eyes sort of thing. This idea of um, the, uh, I mean, I mean, you can't necessarily account for that appearance with, you know, this kind of d divine um, form behind it or something that's impressing on the mind, but uh, it, it could be accounted for purely on a, on a materialist story of reality, say. But um, I do think that, what you're talking about with those moments being the moments when people can really appreciate um, what Christianity has to offer or what um, divinity might have to offer um, is something that a lot of atheists can get on board with. And then I, I agree with you that people can be then really off put by this idea of, you know, squabbling for hours over whether the spirit proceeds from the father and the son or whether it's just from the father or what, you know, like it, it, it seems kind of silly and trivial in the, in, uh, I guess to to the point of what most people find attractive about Christianity, um, and then in that regard, I guess I wanted to to ask you. So one of your chapters is talking about some of the aesthetic considerations of Christianity. So, uh, I mean, you've mentioned some of the the heritage, at least in this country, of you know like churches, cathedrals, um, stained glass windows. The I mean, I get I suppose the art. Um, even if people view Christianity as purely mythological, the the kind of artwork of Christ and the passion narrative and stuff like that can be really appealing to people. Um, could you speak to some of the benefits that um, that people have found, or what what people have found attractive about those aesthetic considerations, but who are sort of you know struggling with being on board with the sort of uh, the metaphysics and and so forth? Yeah, so I think first it is that. Um that sense of uh, transcendence in the face of beauty. Now, not all churches succeed in um, offering beauty, uh, but when we do get it right, then that is, um, that is something which moves people. Um, I mean, I think I'm saying something more than just that, though, and it does rather link into the other two points that I make about benefits, um, which are um, community and the moral compass. Now, we take community and aesthetics and what we do in, in a church together in worship, where there's a liturgy, which is often ancient and evocative of people saying the same words over centuries. Uh, this is a this is a kind of bonding experience, which is um, which is creative and helpful. I think creativity is what we're we're looking for, and interest. I mean, I I keep saying to people now that I live in the countryside and uh, sometimes go to small churches where beautiful singing is impossible. That what we want is something which is interesting above all, and probably short, um, and uh, some nice refreshments afterwards, because these are things that bond people together. And it's been, it's been so evident right. during the lockdown period, during the COVID time, how much people need that community and that um, re relational activity. That you can't be a whole person on your own and if you're isolated you quickly can quickly go mad um, and a, a lot of people have felt um, um, it, it, immense um, mental stress during this time. Christianity is and um, many religions are a built-in way of overcoming these problems and it goes into morality in the sense that um, well, before, if I if I were to stop you on just on the yeah. thought um, about the kind of community of uh, of coming together to, I mean, 
people might have different interpretations of what's going on there. Uh, maybe it's just singing for some people, maybe for other people it's worship. Um, and then, you know, the tea and biscuits after and discussions and so forth. But I suppose, you know, some people might be thinking, well, you know, why not just join, um, you know, a sports team or a chess club or something like that? And I, I think um, you, you talked a little bit in the book about, well, for for some people maybe maybe the vulnerable or the elderly as well it's not it, it's not always possible to have the kind of same kind of inclusivity that the church could have but then an, another idea i think that is important to discuss on that point is this idea that christianity should be about um loving people in those um communal settings but not as this sort of um you know like a creepy inroad to sort of like uh, what do you think about jesus type thing but just for the yeah, sake yeah. of uh, of loving mm. them as well and i wondered if you could if you could just um comment on a few of those thoughts that i was having while you were while, while you were speaking about um the the benefits of, of the communal yeah. aspect well 30 years ago when i was first vicar of uh, university church we had a big homelessness problem um, in Oxford, and uh, we naturally kind of spoke out about this. And one day, the uh, local council called our bluff somewhat and said, "It's all very well for you to um, get a bit of a thrill out of um, self-righteous condemnation of the lack of facilities in this city. What are you going to do about it?" Right. And the churches got together and, and said to the council, "Well." okay <clears throat> tell us what the need is and we'll respond to it and the need was for provision between five o'clock and seven o'clock each night and so we uh, started a drop-in center um uh, people will know what that is like but the point being that some of the christians wanted to convert the people that came for a sandwich and for refuge in that place to their beliefs, to their Christianity. And I was, my point as the chairman of it was that this work of mercy and of care and love of people must be um, indifferent. Uh, that's to right. say, it, it, it mustn't be conditional. Yeah. You know, you, you can't be nice to people only if they'll believe what you believe. You must be nice to them because they are a human being in need and i think um that's one of the dilemmas that um that the the, the the social side of christianity has faced particularly in the um in in the late 20th century and recently i think historically um when churches were and and, and monasteries provided hospitals and the like right um, it, it was open-minded that this was a church for all people. And the Church of England has prided itself for a long time being uh, the church to which every, of which everyone is a member by virtue of living in Britain. Right. Um, but now we've lost that and it's much more exclusive. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's... Um, I, I mean, I, th I think it can be a real shame and a lot of people can recognise some of those good things that um, Christians do. And then they can be like, oh, but it, you know, it's like, it's great that say, for example, these Christians are helping um, divorced people work through their feelings maybe after a divorce. But then it's like, well, the last session, you know, it's like, well, we've helped you out. Now, what do you think about Jesus or something? And it's like, well, that's exploitative yes. or it's a, uh, and it, yes. I, I think there is this sort of tension between, you know, whether, I, I don't know what your what your opinion on this is. Should it be that people that people who are Christians, um, they do it, um, you know, they treat they treat people as ends in and of themselves rather than as means to ends. I suppose might be a way of putting it. And then, um, and and then the idea should be that people then see that they that is an outpouring of Christianity in their life rather than it being the this then sort of oppressive kind of. Um, form of evangelism or I, I, do you have thoughts about about that like what what how do, how does evangelism fit in with the kind of liberal christianity that you have yeah well i think um the new testament itself shows um a, a kind of love of neighbor and a love of the outcast um which is quite unrelated to commitment to a cause and uh 
in 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 the parable of the good samaritan um when the lawyer tests jesus uh, the question is not what must i believe to inherit eternal life but what must i do to inherit eternal life and then jesus tells this story doesn't he of um a man who's been um mugged on the road and uh the religious people pass by because he's unclean and a foreigner a samaritan um binds up his wounds and takes him to a, an inn and pays for his board until he recovers and that is a kind of um um a, a kind of act, act of love and concern which demands nothing in return and that is uh, the genius of Christianity and Christian ethics, it seems to me. I mean, uh, selflessness is fundamental to all Christian ethical thinking. Um, what was it? Was there a second part to your question? Well, so I suppose it, were, it was more to do with. So, how how do you think Christians should think about evangelism? Because I can see how, oh, yes, especially yeah. only for those who are more um, kind of like American Protestant sort of minded, you know, this idea of the need to evangelize um, the lost is going to, I think, come into conflict with that um, that idea of loving people as ends in and of themselves rather than as means to ends, you know, means to showing that, showing like that extrinsic religiosity, look how many yeah. converts I got. So, yeah, yeah it, do, it does do that. And I know some American groups particularly, I don't know if any British ones do, uh, sort of give the equivalent of, of foreign aid, but it's conditional on people right. um, going, going to a church in that place. Um, so I think um, evangelism, as you implied yourself, is that your life, the way you live your life, and the, th and the thoughts that you think, of course, as well, um, should be persuasive to other people um, that this is worth investigating. But a kind of um, uh, hard hammer approach, hammering in the idea that you know you must so uh, you must believe in Jesus or you'll go to hell, is just counterproductive, really. I mean, my experience with students in Oxford <coughs> is precisely that. I mean, there's there's a group of students, less so now I think than thirty years ago, who really spend their time going around saying, if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll right. go to hell. And uh, come along to my my Christian club, which is very enticing and very attractive and very generous and open and so on, but it's all totally conditional. And right. uh, you see it most acutely and most offensively in the case of um, homosexuality, where um, some people have gone along and then as their sexuality has become evident and they, right. they which they've, they're learning they've, about in their time at university right as well yeah yeah exactly yeah, say, and then yeah. they're told well you, you know you can't belong but you you could you could be healed perhaps right. of your homosexuality um but i i've just um put together a book of 10 essays by oxford students called religion and generation z it won't be published until um, early next year. But three of those essays um, mention a kind of exclude, excluding sexual experience that, that, the, uh, that the students have, have had. And I think it's become a really big problem. I mean, I always sort of heaved a heavy sigh when the diocesan authorities, that, that, and that is... The, the local bishop and the, the diocese said, oh, we must have a an evangelical drive. And my response was, but I'm having an evangelical drive all the time just by being the church here in this very public place with so many um, hundreds of thousands of people going through. I mean, for example, on uh, Good Friday, when I first went there, we used to, uh, only opened the church for the hundred or so people who wanted to come in for a three-hour service reflecting on the death of Jesus on the cross. A very serious right. contemplation, of course. But nevertheless, we were excluding people by locking the doors. All around us right. um, were visitors 
from all over the world and Europe, many of them Catholic, who couldn't understand why on a Good Friday of all days they couldn't come into that church. Um, and eventually I devised a, a completely different system. I opened the church, kept the cafe open as well, and had a series of events which people could drop into for five minutes, ten minutes, the Stations of the Cross, a reading of poetry, a playing of music, um, and just what one hour of of strict and very very beautiful liturgy sung by our professional choir, and and that that's evangelism in my view. Right. Yeah. I think I think a lot of people would probably get a lot more out of that. Uh, the aesthetic experience of that as well as much as i have kind of low church friends who i know would really op oppose that view i think for a, for a secular person the kind of how, how that hooks into um maybe our cultural history or maybe it's um our ability to sort of you know co contemplate contemplate things beyond ourselves i think that does it far better than like you know an alpha course or something like that perhaps <laughs> um in, in that, but that in my view uh, yeah and and it, it's important to be welcoming, genuinely welcoming, and inclusive. I mean, inclusive is a word that we've uh, hijacked for um, our part of the church, and it it has actually implied uh, more than perhaps intended uh, inclusivity towards people of uh, different sexuality and, and and gender and all the rest of it. Um, um, but inclusivity is so important when i was when i was a, a vicar in north london at that time we weren't allowed to marry divorced people in church right and you've no idea the number of people that came to me looking to be married in church when they were told this wasn't wasn't possible right. felt so them. excluded mm. that they went out and spread the word <clears throat> and said don't go near the church you know if you're unfortunate enough to have gone through a breakdown of relationship like i have they don't want to know you. Mm. And uh, I started against the church law, but not against the civil law, mar remarrying people who had been divorced. And it's a massive effect of, I mean, the congregation expanded, and not simply because of that, but there was, there was a simple evangelism there by being nice to people and not excluding them and not right. judging them all the time and, saying you're a sinner. I mean, it's important, I think, in in the Christian religion to be aware of sinfulness or wrongdoing. And I think to be a, to be penitent uh, um, about your wrongdoings, in other words, to be self-aware in, mm -hmm. in that sense, is terribly important. And one of the problems of our society is uh, when, and, and with its emphasis on individual rights and going for it and so on, there's little reflection on whether one is actually living one's life well, which is, I think, what... Um, I don't cover this in this particular book mm. at all, but um, I think it's an important point. Um, in in the old days, we used to say prayers, and the British people, our language was, was shaped by Shakespeare and the prayer book and the Bible, mm. but within that language, we were very kowtowing before God, beating our breasts um, for our sinfulness. And then by the time I was ordained in the 60s, people were saying, psychologists were saying, this is terribly bad psychology. Right. And in a sense, of course, it, it was. But now we've gone to the opposite extreme, saying everything's okay. And nobody's much aware of doing anything wrong. Are you saying the golden mean, as it were, would be to sort of have um, to have that approach or, or that that piece of language of sin within Christian theology is this like it, this intrinsic attitude towards seeking out one's wrongdoing, but not this guilt kind of, um, you know, this sort of um, self-loathing almost? Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, no one wants to encourage self-loathing, but... To I sometimes find the burden of my sin intolerable, which is a phrase from the prayer book. In other words, you feel terribly regretful for something that you've done, maybe in relation to your family or whatever. Um, I mean, I have children who um, make demands, and sometimes I'm ungenerous towards them, then I feel 
very sorry about that. Uh, but one of the things that a church and a religion offers is an opportunity for reflection. People sit around quietly. Right. Yes. And that's something you don't generally do, at least not together. Maybe again during this COVID period, people have had more time to be quiet because they're on their own than they would have liked. But we're able to fill our fill our minds with noise from the television or the radio or by sitting on the computer for eight hours a day. Uh, you need to get away from that and to have time for reflection and renewal. Right. Renewal yeah. of life, we say. And if you were uh, in a monastic order, that would be, you might feel you got far too much of that. Yeah, I, th I think... Um... I think those are things that secular people would be able in general to sort of agree with that uh, that the religious life has to offer sort of um you know sacred spaces where there's the symbolism and the there's this kind of area carved out for people to to reflect and to bring calmness but then calmness but then also I suppose in the way of looking at the week and saying you know we're going to keep the Sunday as a day of rest or I I think Good, at least healthy healthy churches in general do quite well at communicating a message of um resting properly as well um yes. which which can be missing i i think I, one thing i wanted to move on to as well was this idea of of moral considerations yes. where um and i think i think there's a bit of nuance um behind this point because some people are going to be more familiar with um, apologists like William Lane Craig, who will put forward the moral argument and say, you know, in order to even be able to to ground morality, we're going to have to, you know, have a God. So uh, if you think that objective morality exists, then then God exists and you're driven to that conclusion rationally. Um, some people maybe are going to have bad experiences of kind of moralism within the church and think that, well, maybe this is a bad consideration. Um, to, you know, this is something that would push them away from uh, from Christianity. But I think for some of the people in in uh, the book who are, again, uh, um, wouldn't describe themselves as Christians in the sort of metaphysical sense, but they, they find this affinity to it, they would say that they sort of find an affinity to the moral teachings in the stories or something like that so what, what what are some of these these moral considerations and how is how does it differ from perhaps again that that sort of simple and imposing evangelical story of you know you you have to rationally believe that uh, you know that in god to get to get morality it's different from that sort of thing and how how so yeah well many of our ethical ideas in our culture derive from christian ethical thinking anyway that's a point one mustn't forget that there is a there is a, an overlapping area between those who would describe themselves as religious and those who would describe themselves as non-religious or atheist um, and it, sometimes we would do the same good act for a different moral reason when we thought about it in other words you might be kind to your auntie because you think that's what God wants, or you might be kind to your auntie because you think um, that, generally speaking, um, that is the most um, profitable and proper thing to do. Um, and it's the same act. But if there is a God, how does God, how does God regard those two acts as different? Because one was done... Uh, with God in mind and the other was done without God in mind and I, I think I think not at least the kind of God that I believe in and people listening to this should not think because I've written a book called Christian Atheist that I am an atheist um, but I do have very severe questions about the whole all the issues raised which make it quite difficult in a modern conservative church to be accepted I think um, somebody with my views is not popular um, amongst many other clergy. And yet I sometimes wonder how honest other clergy are being about what they really believe. And I'm deviating from your point a bit. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I can, you, you feel free to keep going and then I can, I, can, um, I can hone in the question a bit more if that would be helpful after you finish yes, your thought. But I, so to, to, to go back to... Um, ethics i think 
I think that there is a fundamental urge or input for good within the physical creation. One thing we haven't touched upon, although you have touched upon it, the idea that if there is a divine, if there is a God, in other words, God should be of a completely different order from the order which we live in and know and physics tells us about. I don't accept that dualism. I think that there is a God or there is God or creative power for good and love in the universe, in creation, which belongs absolutely, emerges from the um, elements that make up the Big Bang. You know, I don't see that there can be anything which is other than that. And I don't see why the whole Christian story, when, if I dare say, a bit demythologized, doesn't fit into that um, into that view. I mean, when I was a student, demythologizing was all the rage. And uh, now, if you suggest, if you use the word myth in in any conservative Christian circle, uh, people start um, having a fit um, because they think that you're that the whole pack of cards are going to fall down. You're undermining the whole thing. And therefore, I think that um, I think one of my interviewees, um, Roger Teichman, uh, talked about um, Tolstoy in his interview. Um, and uh, he was finding a, a good in that story, which wasn't um, spelt out in absolute Christian terms, even though Tolstoy was a Christian, although also a slightly bad man, um, that, that this goodness can come from any direction. It doesn't come in a sort of, one's got to get out of one's head this idea that there's a God up there and there's goodness up there, and only if you tune into that can you uh, be good in a Christian sense. I mean, P Plato had a similar idea, I think, that there is there is a, a, a goodness which is there in being. And although he didn't say you have got to tune into it, I, I, I think in a way that kind of tuning in to a notion that one has of there being um, a force for good in being itself is, is probably where I stand and where I derive my ideas of God from and when you put the Christian story to that it fits so long as you don't get sidetracked by things like myths like the virgin birth which have nothing to do with Christianity really it's um, the quotation in, in Matthew's gospel comes from a completely different bit of history in uh, in Israel's history, which uh, is speaking about a, a, a young woman known to the king um, and has nothing to do with um, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not suggesting the New Testament authors would do Midrash on the Old Testament to write the New Testament narrative. <laughs> <laughs> that would be <laughs> no. That would yeah. I th I think a lot of people, I who again would consider themselves atheists, but appreciate s someone like Richard Swinburne as a Christian saying, you know, well these these moral moral truths they're necessary truths. So even if you take God out of the picture, it doesn't it doesn't kind of change that. But I I guess I'd want to I I'd, I'd want to see what your thoughts are on well what is that role that the Christian stories are playing then in in morality for people. Um, did, did you catch that? Sorry, do you want me to just say it again? Yes. Yeah. What, what What's the role that those Christian stories are playing for people um, in morality? Well, I think um, when I was um, a vicar in London, um, we did lots of baptisms in those days when people were still having their children baptized, and people would come along to the vicarage and say, "Because um, I don't really believe this stuff myself, but." I want when he or she grows up for them to be able to choose for themselves. And above all, I want them to have the Christian moral compass. And the Christian moral compass, it seems to me, in popular thought, 
and probably in what I think should be the deepest sense is de derives from the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels and this idea that here is a person who does care for the leper, the woman in a, in a very male-dominated uh, society, for the outcast, um, um, for the Samaritan, in other words, the person of a slightly different um, religious point of view, for the tax collectors who were despised in that community. Um, and above all, this this idea which Jesus doesn't articulate for himself, except perhaps a little bit in St. John's Gospel, that he uh, lives a totally self-giving life, and that this self-giving life is um, summed up in the awful tragedy uh, of his death, uh, his torture, his death, um, and the way in which he accepts that. Um, you know, greater love hath no man than this man lays down his life for a friend. So this is the ultimate good deed, the ultimate act of self-giving that you can do. I think that is very resonant. And you can, you can derive all kinds of um, ethical views on diff in different situations um, in life from these principles. And it's not so distant in a way, from um, uh, the idea of character ethics. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that the, the kind of person you are makes you do what you do. And so you want to make the kind of person that you are of good character. A classic example being when a soldier is at war in a really testing situation, and maybe he has captured one of the enemy and he has a gun and that enemy has killed his comrades, does he shoot him or not? And you know that the moral answer is no, you don't You don't shoot him. And uh, he hasn't got time to read the rule book at that point. It depends on the kind of person um, that he or she is. Um, I don't know if I have, I've explained that very well, but I, I think fundamentally, yes, the stories of Jesus, the parables, some of the miracles, and um, his general teachings are the core of what it means to the Christian moral compass. And you, and you think those things are going to be valuable to people, um, even if they have this secular approach to morality, right? Where, there, where there's no, you know, there's there's not necessarily um, some kind of, I don't know, some, some identity claim with God is goodness or something like that. Yeah, because, but, um, because yeah, no, go for um, you know, take... Um, it's easier uh, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into the kingdom of heaven. You, that could be a starting point for any ethical discussion with any group, regardless of whether they're religious or not, because we all know that um, wealth is a moral trap and inequality is a, is a moral trap. Or, um, you know, thou shalt not kill... Um, Jesus is uh, uh, taking that further that um, even to hate your enemy is um, a bad thing. Um, this whole pacifist idea, which seems to emerge, Jesus seems to emerge from the Gospels as a pacifist. And yet we know that there are massive ethical arguments about just war and about, um, you know, the, the classic question um if you if if an invader is raping your wife do you just stand there and watch because you you believe thou shalt not kill or do you go in there mm. and kill that person mm. uh, so there are massive dilemmas but you could it's as a some of jesus is saying that the sabbath was made for man not man for the sabbath if you unpack that one you could apply it to all sorts of situations even to how people behave in Parliament, or how they make laws, or um, how the local local council works. Um, I mean, there, there is w w wonderful, um, thought-inspiring 
our um, discussion creating ideas, I think. So um, I, I've got a couple more questions, but I don't know, how, how are you for time, by the way? Uh, I won't I, be I, too long because my okay. wife is um, holding a, a farewell party for a, 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 a senior member of a charity that she's chair of, but oh, I'll give it's you okay. five I'll, more minutes. Yeah, I'll cut one out then, and I will go straight to the then. What what should um, the church's attitude be to toward Christian atheists? I probably should have um, put. Yeah. And I think I think this. Imagine as well. I mean, I've got a few people who are in in the more evangelical camp who might be listening in, and you know how how should they in particular, I suppose, think about people who aren't too sure about um, those doctrinal points, but um, you know they they're interested and they want to be involved in the conversation. Well, I would say again um, that the church's attitude should be that we are open for discussion. Um, we had a, a conference not so long ago, well, a few years back, um, about the Church of England, and we had critical commentators. I wasn't organising this, but it was in my church. So they had critical commentators who were supposed at the end of each little interview to raise the questions that... Um, that the general public would be raising. But they were insiders, and so their view was totally inside. And I said to the organisers, what you want is somebody who really thinks this is a load of nonsense asking the questions. Otherwise, it's right. not worth the paper is written on. Well, the same with the church. Let's not exclude people who are critical friends. Um, let's embrace them and recognise that... Um, our way of understanding something isn't the only way. Um, it just seems it makes me despair. I think one of the reasons that the church is really going down the drain at the moment as an institution is precisely this unwillingness to engage with the spirit of the age and the, a kind of pride in saying, oh, well, we, yes, we are not interested in the spirit of the age because. You know, we have the ancient authority of God through Jesus Christ, and that's that. And there are no questions to ask. It's a nonsense. Questions have been asked throughout human history. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Christian doctrine has evolved, developed in Newman's term throughout history. And we are not the ones to say that, that we've suddenly come to a standstill. Um, it depends if, you really, if you're really interested in evan evangelism or not. Basically, if you only want to convert people who are going to be clones of yourself, then don't just do that and don't bother. But um, uh, really, the only creative way forward is to recognise that um, in, in religious terms, God created us all differently. Made of one blood, all nations of men, as Paul says. Yeah, I, th I think I myself do find it quite ironic when people take um when people take that the approach um that you know i we've got the one truth at this point in time but then it's like well yeah and that yeah. is the bible but then the bible itself seems to be this document which shows you know like a progression into monotheistic thought and then a progression into hellenistic thought and then you yeah. know Chris, Chris, judaism to christianity and so forth it, it's uh it's yeah. like what what is it if not clearly, this <laughs> clearly fundamentally important but it's a collection of books on the way to understanding. Um, and churches, particularly the Catholic Church, but have, have, have recognised this with their emphasis on scripture and tradition. So tradition is the theological reflection that comes from those biblical times onwards and that we can move forward. And, and the Methodist Church has it even better when they say that the important things are... Uh, scripture tradition reason but they all say reason in other words i should have i should have amplified that you've got scripture and you've got tradition but you've also got reason your intellect mm -hmm. and your ability to reflect on these things as physics advances more and more questions are asked about um what it is to be at all which is a fundamentally religious question in my view, um, one professor of physics says that, that we only know 4% of what there is to know within physics. We know with um, 
with nanophysics that there's all sorts of odd things being discovered. It's, develop, it's a science that is developing. You might even get to a point where the Big Bang no longer becomes the main favoured explanation of the beginning of our universe. Mm. Um, and I think theology can needs to learn from that. You know, we're not going to be stuck in the primeval mud, are we, when human knowledge really advances? Awesome. So I want to thank you for your time and coming on to talk about these things, but also if people um, are interested to hear more, to where, I mean, where's the best place that you'd want people to go and like check out your books or what can people look forward to that you're working on over the next you know year or so? Just hang on. Yeah, no problem. So I've got um, this book. I'll get it in the. Oh, I can. Is that uh, in the yeah. screen or not? Um, it is in the screen. Yeah. So this is my memoir, which is to be published in October, and it tells my story of being a priest over the last 50 years. And I think it's interesting because things have changed so much during that period. It's available for pre-ordering on Amazon. So you've only got to go to Amazon and put in Brian Mountford and you get there. <coughs> um, but it, um, it describes in a more narrative way what I, some of the things I've been trying to say uh, this afternoon. And I know that once one gets talking about it, one can ramble on a bit. And there's, th this is tightly written. Okay. <laughs> this, oh, well, well, maybe clo closer to the time, I can, I'll can. i pick up a copy and have a read, and maybe you can come back yeah. on if you'd want to, and we can talk You really won't be bored by that. And then you've got this one. Uh, let me, there we go. Which is um, the other book I mentioned, which won't actually appear, um, but it, again, is pre-orderable on Amazon. It's, as you see from the subtitle, it specifically addresses why so many young people say they have no religion, which is an established um, sociological fact. So those are two things. I mean, I, if anyone is really interested, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I don't mind um, having short correspondence with people. Okay, great. Well, I, what I... Is, Go on. Oh, sorry, I was. I thought. I thought you'd finished. Sorry, don't worry. It, you would have had. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll play. I'll um. I'll play the um closing credits then for people and end it there. Um, the link is also in the description to your website if people want to go and uh check out more stuff there. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you for coming on. And I'll just play if you, if you want to hang around. I'll just play the credits, which will be like ten seconds. Yeah, sure. Then. I'll I'll wait for you. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.